Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, showing up. And uh, I know it's semi early. Uh, um, we're uh, very glad to have everybody here. And uh, we're also um, very glad to have um, Dr. Uh, Cooley here and uh, Thomas DeWall, um, both uh, experts in um, Eurasia. Um, and we're very proud to present uh, Dr. Cooley's um, publication, uh, Scripts of Sovereignty, uh, Freezing of the Russia-Ukraine Crisis and Dilemmas of Governance in Eurasia, um, publication that basically deals uh, with uh, foreign uh, frozen conflicts as foreign policy and the dilemmas um, of uh, using those frozen conflicts as, as uh, foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Cool is a professor of political science at Barnard College and deputy director for social sciences programming at Columbia University's uh, Herman Institute. He's also the author of four academic books uh, that examine how external actors, including international organizations, multinational uh, companies, NGOs, and foreign military bases have influenced the development and sovereignty of the former Soviet states. Uh, his latest books, Great Games, Local Rules, The New Great Power Contest for Central Asia from Oxford um, Publishers, examines the multipolar politics of US, Russia, China com in competition for influence in Central Asia. And uh, Thomas DeWall is a uh, senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and he specializes in South Caucasus and Black uh, Sea region. He actually has a book just uh, coming out. Uh, out yesterday. Just, uh, out, out, uh, out yesterday. Uh, the Great Catastrophe, Armenians and Turks in the Shadow of Genocide, also from uh, Oxford um, Publishers. So, um, I'm going to have a kind of a quick um, presentation. Dr. Cooley will uh, kind of uh, quickly summarize uh, his work. Then we're going to have um, a little bit of a kind of a table discussion, and we'll open it up to uh, questions. And thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Constantine, and thank you to uh, Center on Global Interests for this platform. It's been a pleasure to work with you um, on this topic, which you know pulls together a lot of um, different topics related to the subject of sovereignty. Um, it, it's, it, it, it sort of looks at where we might be going in Ukraine, but also looks at the spillover effects, network effects, and starts getting at what I think are some pretty profound changes in the sovereignty regime in Eurasia and how they relate both to uh, regional developments and frozen conflicts and to the external dimension of um, uh, the, the, the conflict in Ukraine. And um, also really delighted uh, to have Tom here, whose work I'd drawn a lot and learn a lot from uh, in terms of the Caucasus and the South Caucasus. And um, you know, one of the arguments I'll be making today is that um, there are some uh, profound spillover effects um, that are occurring, um, especially in Georgia, but also in Moldova, and, and perhaps then the causality uh, will reverse. So what do I do in this report? Um, the report starts from um, the justifications given by Russia for the Crimean annexation. And I call these scripts of sovereignty rather than actual legal arguments because I find almost all of them to be legally weak, um, but they're more acts of political performance, right? So Russia uses international law to justify what it has done, even though the legal arguments are weak, but it really uses the grammar, as legal scholar Chris Morgan uh, has says, uh, has argued um, to justify its actions. And these sort of six uh, very prominent types of narratives that we saw, I'll just list them, I explain them more in the report. The first is the narrative of self-determination, uh, the uh, which, uh, you know, paradoxically actually Russia had argued in the Kosovo case uh, could only be invoked in very limited extreme circumstances uh, when groups faced armed conflicts um, and existential threats. Um, so the narrative of self-determination is one. Uh, the second one is the emerging norm of responsibility to protect as adopted by the United Nations. But there again, we, we run into the paradox that Russia has been very skeptical of R2P, calling it um, another circumstance, particularly Syria, a tool of the West uh, to justify intervention. Uh, we've seen intervention justified and annexation on defending Russian co-ethnics. We've seen the script of least strategic territory, uh, the military base in Sevastopol being taken back because it was in jeopardy. Um, this has been invoked a few times. And there's some interesting parameters that Putin himself has stuck to uh, 
in, in, in justifying why the actions undertaken in Crimea actually didn't violate the Lisi Agreement, um, which is interesting, again, staying on the script of that accord. And then the final uh, script is the Kosovo script. Um, and, and here I, I find uh, some important points, actually, that, that come from Moscow, less because of the analogy that's often made between Kosovo and South Ossetia, and more because of um, um, the sort of power politics that Moscow uh, points to regarding the Kosovo precedent. Um, you know, irregardless of whether Kosovo deserved independence or not, I actually could make a case why it was. I think um, uh, what really bothered uh, Russia was this idea that Kosovo didn't constitute a precedent. Why? Because it doesn't. It's sui generis. It is almost the sort of a diplomatic equivalent of because we said so. And that is power politics of the highest order. And, and so I think, you know, in some ways, this making the Kosovo analogy is tantamount to saying, you get to make unique rules, so do we, right, in our, in our neighborhood. So that's sort of the final kind of script that's out there. Some other issues that I had. So given this, um, these sorts of scripts of justification, um, what are we seeing in Crimea and in East Ukraine, and how do we relate them to this changing sovereignty uh, regime? The um, uh, second part of the report argues that what we're seeing in East Ukraine is um, possibly, perhaps now more probably, the freezing of East Ukraine into another frozen conflict. In other words, the frozen conflicts of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and I use the term even though I realize they're not frozen anymore, right? I'm just using it as a term of art to delineate these special Eurasian de facto states, unrecognized states, um, has become itself a sovereign model. Right? That's my point. Right? So we're modeling, potentially, um, a political status in East Ukraine based on experiences in Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. And, and that, I think, is, is, is taking uh, uh, the paradigm into a new direction, uh, uh, in essence, because it's acknowledging that their state of being is itself a sovereign model. It's not just temporary on the way to de facto, uh, or, or rather, um, conflict resolution or annexation or fully recognized sovereignty. It's this kind of distinct kind of organizational form. Uh, I would also argue that as a result of the Ukraine crisis, uh, we're seeing spillovers in changing the status of the other frozen conflicts. And Tom's written a lot about this. Um, but in some ways, this is the mirroring of the signing of the EU um, cooperation agreements. Right, that if Georgia is going to sign an agreement and Moldova is going to sign an agreement with the EU, then Transnistria uh, and actually more pressingly now South Ossetia and Abkhazia are going to sign their own integration agreement with Russia. And so we're moving from this paradigm where we had these de facto de jure, or rather de jure states that were formally independent, recognized by Russia and a couple of Central American uh, countries, uh, to this, this rather, one Central American, one Latin American. In Nauru, um, to, the, to this paradigm where actually we're acknowledging their integration into this Russian uh, type of space. And this, I think, is quite, quite profound, is also shifting the ground. At the same time, I would argue, um, if we do have a freezing of the conflict, these de facto states in eastern Ukraine, um, whatever polity emerges, recognized or not, is actually going to deeply influence the future of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, because East Ukraine has a bigger population, it's more geopolitically important, more contested, um, has a viable industrial base. You know, all these reasons, actually, <laughs> the Donbass will be the preeminent sort of, you know, de facto state. And I think this will have knock-on effects in the other regions, especially, especially in the way in which Russia potentially organizes its relations with it. A couple of other points, um, then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Tom. Um, the fundamental challenge Moscow faces in all this is that although it can try to rewrite the rules of sovereignty, of recognition, um, within its own regional sphere, uh, getting recognition for this at the international level is very difficult, right? So there's a fundamental asymmetry here in global governance. The West actually um, uh, controls or sets standards or supervises many more international fora and organizations than Moscow does. So Moscow's attempt, right, to integrate this sort of CIS2 space, or Crimea, uh, uh, has run into real difficulties of recognition. Um, and in some ways, I think, there's a lot of talk that Crimea is a done deal, it should just be recognized and so forth, but actually, uh, Moscow's encountered real difficulties 
in uh, including Crimea in some very fundamental international rulemaking from air traffic control to uh, 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 trade agreements to uh, sporting agreements, and I go through some of these uh, through these in, 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 in the report. Um, so uh, again, this sort of circumscribes the sphere in which Moscow can make rules or make this sort of these alternative rule sets. And the final uh, substantive point of the report is that the West also follows its own scripts of sovereignty uh, when it comes to divided states. And for a long time, Western policy has been characterized by two fundamental pillars, right? One is insisting on promoting the territorial integrity and supporting the territorial integrity of these uh, uh, parent uh, states that are divided, especially Georgia, uh, Moldova, uh, on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, championing their integration into uh, Western architectures and international institutions. And while that itself was a script that seemed viable for a while, it's clear now that the geopoliticization of these separate, of, of these separated, divided states uh, is making those two twin pillars increasingly at odds. In other words, there seems to me a choice down the road, even though everyone a few will sort of publicly acknowledge this, that we can either try and salvage territorial integrity and deal more uh, 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 head-on with conflict resolution, creating mixed zones of governance um, and influence, and that's going to be a very, very tall order. I'm not even sure Moscow is necessarily interested. Or uh, if we continue with attempts at European integration, we need to start accepting um, really the de facto separation of these places, right? Because he's not going to come back to Georgia within the parameters of Georgia joining Western institutions. I'm not going to want to do it. And it's not a matter of the Abkhaz sort of seeing how better developed Georgia is anymore. We're long beyond that. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's some, these sort of fundamental principles of sort of, you know, supporting the sovereignty uh, of these states um, also, I think, blocks us from seeing potentially, potentially, some uh, uh, potential ways out of the current mess. Uh, I'll just go to the scenarios, my very final point. Um, so I outlined four of them in the report. Where are we going in terms of these compromised sovereignty formulas? Scenario one would be full annexation of the Donbas by Russia. I don't think that's going to happen. Not many people um, do. It would create all sorts of costs and headaches for Russia. Uh, also, I think there is a, a distinction uh, between Crimea and East Ukraine. Uh, uh, the second scenario, which I thought was not as plausible, I'm starting to change my mind on, and that is recognizing the Donbass as de jure independent, but under Russian patronage, right? The sort of Abkhazia-South Ossetia paradigm post-2008. Um, I didn't think this was on the cards for a while, uh, in part because of the cost. This wouldn't uh, um, really do anything for the sanctions regime. It would obviously be opposed by Kiev. Uh, and also, Moscow lost a lot of credibility uh, in its attempt to use the sovereign form for Abkhaz and South Ossetia, going around the world trying to secure diplomatic recognitions, which it really failed to do. Uh, and it actually lost a lot of political capital, right? The idea that only, sir, you spent $50 million on Nehru, or Nauru, rather, to, you know, to, to recognize Abkhaz. You know, that, that actually doesn't enhance your status and prestige. It does the opposite. Um, um, so for all these reasons, I thought it's unlikely to actually have de jure states. I'm not so sure anymore. Um, but, but we can, you know, I'd like to hear Tom's opinion and, and then your opinion on this. The third uh, model is the idea of a negotiated constitutional solution, right, that mixes some sort of uh, radical decentralization of the uh, Donbass with a guarantees uh, that Ukraine will not integrate into the West, right, or creating some sort of, you know, mixed zones of influence. Um, that seems increasingly unlikely now on both sides, actually. I mean, I think the Russian es military escalation sort of shows that they're not particularly interested anymore in creating uh, a, a, you know, a formal peace process, whereas in Ukraine, politically, this would be toxic now. Um, and um, I think the fourth scenario is then the frozen conflict scenario. And, and so the question for me is, do we have really a frozen conflict under um, Russian recognition that this is still Ukrainian sovereign territory, or rather, do we have the creation of a Novorossiya statelet um, that Moscow recognizes and then embarks on uh, mm -hmm. some other possible recognitions for? Um, so I will just you know, throw those out there and 
be very curious to hear uh, Tom's take on uh, both the report and what he sees as you know the links between these different sort of spaces over the, over the last year, and of course hear your thoughts too. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Alex. Um, it's a great report, and I recommend everyone to read it if they haven't uh, already. So thanks very much for the invitation to be here uh, here today. Um, I'm just going to make a, f a few comments. I think one of the things that you pick up um, just from reading the newspapers and Alex just put it in great more detail, is this is a, uh, a situation in which sort of fundamental European sovereignty ideas are in, are in flux. Um, so you've kind of taken your camera and, and give us, given us a snapshot, um, which is incredibly useful. Um, but in one month, two months' time, we, we could be talking about very different scenarios. Um, and, um, and we should also remember that this is not just about Russia uh, the West and the um, metropolitan states, as I call them. This is also these local entities do have politics of their own, which do not, which um, often overlap with their patrons. Sometimes a patron, sometimes eighty or ninety percent, but sometimes don't. And and, and it's the yeah. the missing bit which is often interesting. Um, yeah. For example, Abkhazia, the way Abkhazia, the Abkhaz rewrote the first draft of the treaty that, that was sent to them by Moscow, um, which was an integration treaty, they sent it back as a partnership treaty and they took out lots of elements from it. Um, that's just one example. I think the fact that South Ossetia has not yet got a, a final draft of its treaty also shows that there's bargaining going on that. Now, um, for the world at large, maybe this is not so interesting, but for those of us who study these um, conflicts, the, the, the small details are important and can sometimes um, make a big difference. Um, so, um, um, I think the key point I want to make, and Alex does bring this out in this report, but I want to kind of um, uh, put more importance on it, is how all of these entities and conflicts are different, um, and possibly getting more different as time goes by. Uh, Tolstoy, you, you, to quote Tolstoy, you know, all recognized states are alike, but all, maybe all unrecognized states uh, unrecognized <coughs> in their own way. Um, um, and Abkhazia and South Ossetia, were, which were often put in the same basket a few years ago, are now yeah. um, quite different. South Ossetia looking for some kind of full integration with Russia. Abkhazia trying to hang on to some kind of autonomy or de facto sovereignty, which puts it often in conflict with Russia. Nagorno-Karabakh, which we haven't really mentioned, again, spinning off in a completely different direction, where the the Russian element is there, but it's, it's, it's very much secondary to the local Armenian-Azerbaijani um, dynamic or um, conflict dynamic, um, and in which Russia and the West is uh, in many ways still on the same page when it comes to the strategic uh, vision for, for Karabakh, if not on, on the details. Uh, Transnistria, um, again, um, separate, not recognized by Russia in 2008, um, and having this funny kind of triple identity where it um, has a kind of political allegiance to Russia as the main patron, uh, but it also gets all its imports from Ukraine and all its, and 70% of its exports going out via Moldova to the European Union. So a, a kind of, and, and three nationalities in, in Transnistria, Russians, Ukrainians, and Moldovans. Um, there are no, Transnistria does not constitute an ethnic category in itself. So Transnistria is, is, is separate as well. Um, and Kosovo, which is, um, I think, in a very weird um, position for a state in the world, is now, last time I checked, I, um, reading this, I think it was 110 states have recognized Kosovo, but it's still not a, a member of the United Nations. So it's a kind of, um, it's moved way beyond these um, uh, other entities. It has an embassy in Washington. It has a certain international status, but it's not a full international status. So. Um, very, all very different, um, and I think um, that is, impor is important. Now, if we add on to that uh, Donbass, um, there is um, some key differences between Donbass, which again, you highlight in your report, Alex, and, and the other entities. Um, but um, again, I'd like to kind of highlight them. No, no Soviet era autonomy, which means there's no um, borders, recognized borders of uh, um, apart from the, the two oblasts uh, of, of where, as it were, this new entity begins or ends, um, which also means there's no tr um, kind of 
uh, autonomous Soviet autonomous structure, which is what the um, Abkhazia, the Setians, and the Karabakhis inherited. Um, much bigger size, uh, as you mentioned, um, and also um, um, an economic question, which I'm going to just come back to uh, at the end. Um, the other thing which um, I found really interesting in your report is is the fact that that um, these places exist in themselves, but they're also clearly trying to be used as instruments or as pawns in a game between Moscow and, and the West on, on bigger issues. Um, you mentioned already, Alex, the way that the uh, Sokov, who wrote the drafts of the Abkhaz and South Ossetian uh, new treaties, um, I'm sure was doesn't really wake up every morning worrying about the people of Abkhaz in South Ossetia. Um, he, this was his kind of attempted a counter move at, at Georgia's association agreement with the European Union. Um, this obviously poses dilemmas for um, the Georgians and, and the Ukrainians and so on, how to, how to respond. But I think, also think it, it, it poses a dilemma for Moscow in the sense that there is a, a dynamic, the, the further you push on this, the more you are just strengthening those yeah. in Georgia and Moldova who say, well, well, let's just keep the border and just move full speed ahead towards Brussels. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, we're not going to accept that we've lost these places de jure, um, but we're not going to, um, there's nothing we can, we can do to, to recover them now. And um, if we've lost, you know, a few hundred thousand voters who might be dragging us back, then maybe that's no bad thing. So there are, so um, th this is a, problem that you face in Moscow, that the, the, the more you seek to integrate these places, the more you may be pushing Tbilisi or Kiev for Chisinau um, in the other direction. Um, we've already seen that in Ukraine with, you know, the, um, just losing just two million voters yeah. in Ukraine, or probably more than two million voters, probably five million if you count Donbass, uh, helped tip the election towards, um, towards Poroshenko and, and kind of pro-Western force, political forces. So there's a, there's a dilemma there in Moscow, um, and um, if we presume that NATO membership, um, this could indeed be a drag on, on, on the issue of NATO membership, but if we, if we presume that Ukraine has m many, many more important priorities at the moment rather than, Na than the NATO question, um, just surviving as an economically viable state seems to be the number one um, priority, then, then that instrument is also not, not, not very powerful as well. Um, and let me just finish with that, with a few thoughts on uh, the economy. Obviously, you can't mention everything, Alex, but I think this is it's yeah. something to be explored. Um, um, and this is something I want to explore in a paper I want to do on Abkhazia um, this year, on Abkhazia, Transnistria, and the different approaches to them the fact that Abkhazia has been isolated economically from Georgia, whereas Transnistria is still connected economically to Moldova, has, has produced very different outcomes there. Um, I think Donbass is, is going to be, um, I think the economy is actually going to be a very crucial element in the way this turns out. Um, you mentioned that it has a viable industrial base. Well, um, maybe in potential, but at the moment it's a complete disaster. What we hear from there is, is that the, uh, the mines um, have been flooded because um, they haven't been kept up and the uh, factories are not working. Um, the, there's a massive uh, emigration of up to maybe a million people. Um, maybe a quarter of the population has left either um, to the rest of Ukraine or to Russia. Um, so um, it's one thing if you're, again, Moscow to subsidize South Ossetia or Abkhazia or uh, Transnistria, they're actually, the Russians are actually beginning to complain a bit about subsidizing Transnistria, but again, that's less than half a million people. Crimea, I guess you, you get at some, the, the economic subsidy of Crimea, you do get some payback, you've integrated it as your part of the federation. Um, but um, there must be some questions at some point asked in, in, in Moscow, what do we want to do about the economy of Donbass, a place that we haven't recognized, which has these, run by these rogue <coughs> elements that we're using as an instrument against Ukraine, but maybe not, it has certain utility, but not full utility. But there are two million people there. Do we, who is going to 
support the industry if this uh, entity is going to yeah. survive, uh, if anything, rather than just a kind of yeah. black hole um, where criminality will rush in. So I think that's a question, um, which, and I think that's something we have to watch closely. We want to watch someone like Rinat Akhmetov, who used to be the kind of industrial economic patron of, of Donbass, who's been a bit playing both sides, yeah. more with the Ukrainian side. Um, but if deals are to be done, um, I think they're going to be done um, on an economic basis, and, and, um, and that I think is the place to watch. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. So we look at these frozen conflicts, and eventually we mentioned South Ossetia as being uh, kind of more integration. Mm -hmm. So do we see integration here as um, in an end game or itself? Or is this basically the last resort for the Russians as like, well, screw you. Like, you guys are going to, well, we're just going to integrate um, the, this territory into us. We'd rather have it as a frozen conflict, but, you know, to hell with it. Let's. Um well, I, I think there are different opinions on that, which is possibly why we haven't seen a final draft of the agreement. Um, uh, I mean, the big anomaly here, when you look at South Ossetia and North Ossetia, the two Ossetian entities, is. Um, South Ossetia probably has a population of 30 or 40,000 currently. Um, it used to, in the Soviet era, it was about 100,000. Um, 21,000 people voted in the election uh, last year, which gives you a, a kind of snapshot of. Um, and North Ossetia has a population of, I think, 700,000. So officially, officially, Moscow recognizes a place of about 30,000 as an independent state, uh, whereas a place of 700,000 people is an yeah. autonomous republic. Uh, and of course, Ossetians really um, don't care as long as they uh, have a close relationship with North Ossetia. I mean, you know, they want integration with North Ossetia. Uh, and North integration with North Ossetia means de facto integration uh, with Russia. I think that's what's yeah. going on. Um, but I mean, uh, Ossetians, I think, would also be happy for the border to be open because um, <coughs> what you hear from there is that the um, they used to trade much more with Georgia. The prices have gone up and so on. So th there's all sorts of things going on there in which um, the kind of long-term interests of South Ossetia seem to be a bit way, way down the agenda. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if this is a very well thought out end game. It might well be the end game. <laughs> but I'm not sure how it's been drawn up. And, and, you know, I share sort of, you know, Tom's reading the mimetic qualities of this. Sort of, sort of cup is is almost this is there's a performative aspect to this right you sign an integration agreement we sign an integration agreement you justify it in terms of sovereign choices we justify it in terms of sovereign choices right it's 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 the scaling up of sort of what aboutism right and 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 anything you can do we can do in our space which is part of the fundamental tension here right so Moscow wants to justify what it does in terms of international rules, norms, and scripts on the one hand, but on the other hand, it wants to be a revisionist power and reject the relevance of those rules in its own space. And then I think you see the, the conflict between those morphing and, and they're dealing with the issues as they come along and trying to manage them. Um, I think Tom is absolutely right on the economic dimension. I mean, the only you know, additional point I would make on this is that the economics of these places can change pretty quickly. Right, and 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 it does relate to policies undertaken by parent states, by the international community, um, and so forth. So, um, you know, Tom rightly points out, prior to 2004, um, South Ossetia was trading mostly with Georgia. In fact, um, there was a you know a, a huge uh, you know major market there um, that had become a hub for commerce and smuggling and legal and illicit things. But anyway, it was quite the beacon. And the perception at the time was that this was giving momentum, actually, to integration efforts, right? Of course, it was always going to be difficult. Um, but, but, you know, there might have been something there. And then, of course, the new Georgian government went into it in, in a different direction. And I would just point out, you know, I, I think of Kazi in some ways post-2008, although I, I agree they're all different. You're absolutely right about this. But, but I think it does offer some lessons, right, about what walling off um, these enclaves and statelets, what kinds of identities and allegiances it produces, and also what kinds of economies it produces, right? So by passing the law on occupied territories, right, which criminalized uh, 
essentially uh, external dealings between Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the outside world, um, there was a sort of a, a choice forced onto the Abkhaz, which said, you know, you either deal with the Georgians or you deal with Russia. Well, that's an easy call for the Abkhaz. Uh, and, you know, I, I see, you know, Gerard Toal in, in the crowd, so I, I won't drag you into this in taking sides, but I think, you know, the amazing data he's gotten um, through his surveys and his colleagues in the de facto state show some pretty clear political allegiances and perceptions about the economies, right? So with the Abkhaz perceive that there's more economic opportunity in Russia than there was in Georgia, right? So this idea that somehow we'll wall them off, right? And then, you know, through strategic patience, they're going to want to join Georgia. It didn't happen that way. It actually backfired. Um, so I think that's, to me, one of the really unfortunate lessons here, that I'm not claiming that the Abkhaz could have been pried away um, from the Russian orbit. I, I don't think that would have been the case, but to at least have had some options, some contact with the international community, you know, NGOs, educational exchanges, economic actors, and so forth, all that was cut off um, essentially through uh, the law and occupied territories. So uh, uh, I think it's unfortunate, and I think it's a real lesson, right? And I think, um, you know, Tom's absolutely right, you know, and I didn't mean to imply that industrial production was the same. In fact, it's a fraction of what it was. But I think, you know, clearly the attempt to pick off some of these different uh, surrounding towns and cities and attempt to sort of recreate this sort of industrial chain possibly in the future, whether it works or not, um, I don't know. But I do see, you know, some similarities, right? So the Ukraine, you know, Kiev uh, withdrawing support, uh, social welfare payments and subsidies uh, for the Donbass. Okay, it's understandable politically, right? You guys want us to see, we're not gonna support you. And, and it is sort of a real sort of emotive quality to it. Um, on the other hand, it's magnifying, it's, 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 it's economically informing this geopoliticization of, 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 of the conflict, or there's probably a better way of, of, of putting that. Um, and it's creating, you know, clear lines of economic division too. So um, I think, you know, the Abkhaz case again, they're all different, but I think there are some telling lessons, and it all happened rather quickly, right? And 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 uh, and I said it too. And Transnistria is a really good case, right? There's a case where even, um, you know, USAID or the EU do run projects that are about ec promoting economic development and integration, um, access to the European market, and so forth. You have different procedures that have been run there, so there are other ways to engage. Um, with these spaces, right? It doesn't have to be this complete sort of geopolitical division that, that we're heading to. Thank you, and I just wanted to add about the, the, the performance, uh, I think it was uh, yesterday or the day before, that the uh, Russian Duma um, uh, decided yeah. to condemn uh, West Germany for annexing East Germany. Uh, <laughs> and, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a uh, really good point in terms of, um, you know, kind of this, Emotional to where, like, you know, you have the separatists, the people in the ambassador, and you would cut them off, and then, in fact, it kind of uh, eventually um, backfires. No, no matter how good Ukraine is doing, still people see kind of like, well, Ru you know, um, Russia was there for us, uh, you know, um, during the hard time. So perhaps there's some lessons for, you know, uh, Ukraine not to completely kind of. Uh, uh, abandon uh, the buzz, as you mentioned. Actually, somebody suggested, right? Let's just let them go, and then you know, eventually, we'll be so good and so prosperous that um, they'll come back to us. Um, I guess now we'll just open it up to um, questions. And um, if you could just please state your affiliation and keep your question to a question, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jeff Goldstein of the Open Society Foundation. Uh, it seems to me, uh, and I look forward to reading the article. And my apologies. Uh, if you covered this, but that the biggest difference between this conflict and the previous ones is that Russian engagement during the hot phase of the conflicts in the other ones was tactical, whereas this one it seems to be much more strategic. That, in other words, the Russian activities in the Donbas isn't about the Donbas; it's about Ukraine. Yes. And so, I'd like your comment on uh, a theory that someone um, told me the other day, which is that Russia doesn't want this, at least at this point, to become a frozen conflict that they want to keep the conflict, uh, as this person put it, slushy, to keep being able to regulate the pressure on the Ukrainian government, to let winter and Ukraine's economic crises take its course, and then see where things are, perhaps looking at uh, some crumbling of EU uh, unity, and that in, in Russia's mind right now, 
this is not about the Darwin bias. It's still, I mean, doesn't really say which of your scenarios this will lead to, but it's really, yeah. unlike the other frozen conflicts, much more about the, the big country than about the separatist entity. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for that. Uh, I, I, I think that's mostly right. And, and actually, I would add another layer to it. I don't think it's actually just about the frozen conflict, and I don't think it's just about Ukraine. I really do think it's about competing orders. Right. I mean, I think you know this. This is a, a kind of a, a tripartite conflict, and you know this is one of the differences that we have in the West, and and I think the Russian perspective on this. Right. We see this ab about Ukraine, and about the dismemberment of its sovereignty, and about restrictions on its sovereign choices, and so forth. Um, Russia sees this more as an international world, uh, international order, regional order type of issue. Right. That has implications. For potential solutions, right? Because it's difficult for me to see, you know, the outlines of any kind of negotiated compromise where we don't deal with some of these international order issues, right? Where we don't deal with questions of how do you reconcile competing economic spaces, right? Could there ever be a way to broach an EEU space and an EU space, right? Now, you might sort of push back and say, yeah, but the EU, you know, two of its members were coerced into it. <laughs> Lukashenko wants out, Nazarbayev is really concerned, and so forth. You know, why in the world would we ever legitimize that, engage with it? On the other hand, if that is part of the solution, right, offering some sort of dialogue mechanism within these countries uh, to that, then I think it should be considered, right? Especially if it tends to be sort of relatively costless. So part of the problem is a lot of this is about competing orders, it's about international status, um, it's about rulemaking. And so within the kinds of face-saving measures that offer us a way out, it just seems to me logical some of those have to be given, right? And that's, that's a very sort of, you know, abstract way. I think your point on does Russia actually want a frozen conflict, I'm not sure that we know. I mean, and I'm not sure that there is sort of a coherent strategy here. And it might be changing given international realities, facts on the ground, the price of oil, the impact of sanctions, and it might go in unpredictable ways, right? Um, we still don't know whether, you know, the power of sanctions are going to change Russian behavior, right, in the way that we deem to be more uh, acceptable, whether it's going to have the opposite effect, right? So there's a in kind of the so social sciences literature, right, there's a, a kind of a, a literature on socialization and international opprobrium and so forth. But as I mentioned in the report, there's also new studies on, um, on stigmatization as a form of social status, right? And the more sort of the West stigmatizes, uh, <laughs> the more defiant Russia might become. And, 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 you know, in part, this sort of, one of the scripts I think I omitted that I talked about in the report is, uh, you know, the, the, the holy conflict script that you're seeing more and more. And to me, that's a kind of realization, no matter what the material costs, it doesn't matter. You're not changing our behavior because this is absolutely holy and uncompromising. So, so I think it's, 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 it's a three-level conflict. And you know, one, one, one final issue, um, I think Russia may have some preferences, but as Tom said, events on the ground are also going to play a role. And how do you control these guys? Right? We have this sort of idea that you know, everything is under Moscow's thumb. And of course, you know, the release of you know, military hardware, weapons, irregular forces, special forces, uh, yes, that is. But in terms of their political preferences, um, their political organization, um, you know, their, their building of all the de facto institutions of statehood, rolling that back um, is going to be very difficult. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's something, this, this kind of, the Donbass-Moscow part of the relationship is something we don't fully uh, realize, and that's going to start generating momentum of its own, too. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that, it, you know, I think that's a really good um, point, because I, I think it's one of the issues people always, you know, like you mentioned, think that... Um, uh, the separatists are, you know, completely dominating. Like you mentioned, probably they're, uh, you know, being instructed certainly uh, by the Russians. But if you kind of check out social media and even some of these new Russia websites, and there's severe criticism of Putin as not doing enough. Right. And there's been some suggestion that when they removed uh, uh, Igor Strelkov, remember the original kind of the guy who basically said he started the Donbass uh, separatist movement, 
there was some suggestion that basically he was getting out of hand and Kremlin didn't think he was uh, basically could be uh, controlled. So that's a, actually a really good issue to explore. Well, my name is John Dalton. I teach uh, political science at Blackwood College. Um, to widen the perspective a little bit, um, if we look at we look at six years of an administration that seems uh, bound to reprove the point that weakness is provocative. Uh, maybe January 1917, the possible replacement of this administration with something far more conservative and assertive in Central Europe uh, would give would reinforce the previous point and give uh, Putin a timeline. Comment, please. So define. Uh, what the policies of being more assertive would be in your in your menu of, of alternatives? Uh, arming the Ukrainians, okay. uh, or at least you know, uh, lethal uh, resupply, uh, uh, oil supplies to Eastern Europe, and you know, probably excess you know natural gas and uh, petroleum supplies to Europe, Western and Eastern Europe. Other things that this administration could have done is quite clearly elected not to. Yeah, I you know I, I I I'm not so much into the the sort of I know I know, I know it's Washington I'm just here for the few hours uh, sort of the partisan side of things um, I, I I I do have concerns about arming Ukraine um, in that just as we face a fundamental asymmetry in who controls global governance right the West is far more uh, uh, in charge of sort of the levers and the norms and the rule making and so forth than Russia is. There's an asymmetry of how much Ukraine matters to the two sides, right? For Russia, this really is existential, right? It's, it's their border. It is part of their space. And so this idea of arming Ukraine without the commitment um, um, to defend it, to me, just you know, is, is, is escalating in a situation where you know, it seems obvious to me that the Russians have escalation dominance here and that you know, the very last ruble will be poured into this conflict. And I think part of this is, you know, signaling just the credibility, the intensity of their commitment to it. So, so I'm not sure that's necessarily the answer. Um, you know, I, I do think there were um, certain warning signs here, right? Um, that I think there was sort of just an assumption that, you know, with the Maidan that all of a sudden um, you know, Ukraine would be brought back into the fold through sort of natural means. Like, this was it. The dictator is gone, right? The crowds are in the street. We took on this narrative of democracy. You know, some officials started talking about it and, and tweeting it and so forth. Uh, and I think what we did was we underestimated exactly how existential it is to Russia, right? That Russia literally rewrote the rules. It redrew boundaries. Because at the end of the day, um, the West has regional, you know, the European Union, regional trade organization, it has NGOs, right, which Putin has likened to special forces. It has the whole gamut of institutions of international order. What does Russia have? It has cheap energy. It can buy some bonds. Um, it has some humanitarian programs, but all this while oil is, is high. In other words, the, the levers that it has are okay for maintaining some client states, but in the bigger, bigger schema, um, it needs to resort to force in these cases because its, it's, it's array of international order tools just isn't comparable. And I think that's what you see with Ukraine. You literally redrew the borders rather than sort of playing in that domain. And don't forget FSB, SVR. Absolutely, SVR. absolutely, yes, yes, yes. I'm uh, Gerard Toll. I'm a professor at uh, Virginia Tech. Thank you for, for this study, Alex, um, and uh, Tom, for your comments. Um, I, I have two questions. One concerns this um, will to homogenize yeah. that you see in the uh, New York Times, yeah you see in the political community here and elsewhere. Um, and the dangers that that has for how the West or the Euro-Atlantic community approaches these particular conflicts. Uh, it, it does seem that um, the Donbass is being folded into 
the same sentence as Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh as neo-Soviet states or Russian-supported client states, when it is incredibly different, and when you have 22 years of it being part of a separate sovereign state, and is now seceding from it, as opposed to Abkhazia, South Ossetia, that never were part of an independent Georgia, and Nagorno-Karabakh, which claims, of course, that it seceded from Soviet uh, Azerbaijan. Um, so there's a, a tremendous distinction there to be made, as not to mention the, the particular size. That does seem to have certain dangers for how the Euro-Atlantic community approaches these these er uh, areas in as much as they see it as a sort of crusade against these neo-Soviet. Some people would see it as a the more sort of enlargement, uh, neocon 3.0 or whatever, uh, would see it uh, perhaps, perhaps in those terms. But it also seems like it's got uh, challenges for mm -hmm. folks in Abkhazia too, and in South Ossetia, who may want to differentiate themselves yeah. from the Donbass. Crimea is a, is a separate issue. So that's, that's question number one. Question yeah. number two uh, concerns the degree to which your, your I guess, um, perspective on, the, on, the, on another discourse which is very powerful here uh, and rising uh, in, the, in the West, which is to see Russia's actions as essentially the uh, actions of a sort of kleptocratic elite. So it's a Karen Duisha argument mm -hmm. And therefore, you read what's happening in Crimea in terms of corporate raiding. Mm -hmm. uh, so Akhmetov's, uh, uh, his particular properties there kind of been uh, taken over by, by Russian oligarchs. It's the Mark Galeati argument, too, about this sort of being a kind of criminal um, um, patrimonial geopolitics, yeah. where they're after property and, and, and so on and so forth. Right as opposed to what you are using uh, is so far, which is to see it in a larger context of Moscow and Russian geopolitical culture. Yeah. So if you could comment on yeah. the degree to which you kind of want to separate those two things out. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick swing at those and <laughs> let Tom, <laughs> the Tom come in. I mean, it's fascinating. And, 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 you know, your, I mean, I think your own insights into sort of geopolitics and emotion and geopolitics and, and, and sort of crafting, you know, has, has, has helped me under, under, or helped me understand, helped me sort of formulate some of these perceptions I have. I mean, I think all three actors here, Brussels, Washington, and Moscow, are looking for lenses to unify the contestation of this space, right? And to try and find guiding principles that apply to all of them. So yes, they're all different, um, but I think this is part of the policymaking process here. I think there is certainly an extension here, what the policy has been since the early 1990s, of strengthening the sovereignty and independence of the post-Soviet states, which reads strengthening relations with anyone but Moscow, right? Um, if, you want, if you want to be honest about it. Um, so I think that's the kind of script here that we're trying to unify policy. But Brussels too, right? The Eastern Partnership, this is what it did, right? We, and I, I'm not defending the neighborhood policy because I thought that was incoherent. But, but in its incoherence, it allowed these sort of more nuanced, tailor-made packages to the North African states, right? To Eastern Europe. I mean, essentially it got technocrats thinking about what are the needs of this and what's the relationship between this particular uh, uh, polity and the European Union. By trying, by going to the East European Partnership, we, we, we kind of homogenized kind of six different agreements under a common set of, of principles and rubrics. And lo and behold, Moscow, as well as certain populations within these states, thought that this was geopoliticized and quite threatening, right? And then when Barroso steps in and says, no, negotiations are only going to be with us, right? That, 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 that strikes me as particularly sort of tone deaf. It's, and again, I'm not saying Ukraine doesn't have the right to negotiate, right, <laughs> with, with, with different entities over different sort of economic architectures. But for Barroso to believe that there could be an exclusive negotiating track 
right? That Russia wouldn't be a party, wouldn't care, there wouldn't be consequences, I think was uh, really foolish and I think was born out of, again, this sort of deciding on a set of homogenizing sort of tracks and then pursuing them all in each of these sort of different countries. Ukraine was in Georgia, right? It just wasn't on this uh, kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, I think Moscow scripts with sovereignty. And I, I agree with Tom. So he's talking about the flip side, right? The more they try and draw them in, um, integrate them and so forth, the more pushback it will cause. And I think the more it then pushes the parent state away. But I think you also are looking for a common set of framework to unify these spaces. And it's difficult legally, right? It's difficult because so much regional integration is premised on the norm of sovereignty and recognition. So in some ways, you have to go, go outside of it, which then leads to reliance on more informal actors, mechanisms, and so forth. I think the patrimonial politics is a code word for something they do. I agree with you. I think the one caveat I would have is I'm still not convinced that this kind of regional economic order Russia would like to, to, to create um, isn't just a deal between kinds of economic clients with lots of side payments. In other words, when, 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 when the EU was first formulated, it was simulated on the EU, right? And the idea would you have um, you know, voluntary unions, different economic functions, you would have uh, 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 you know, stages of integration. You'd have supranational bodies that would adjudicate rules, and, and, and there was sort of an interesting template. I think one of the things that the Ukraine crisis did um, is that it uh, signaled the urgency to sign the deal, and in doing this, then I think Moscow gave away pet concessions to different countries to join, right? So the Armenians gave them sort of 700 exemptions on tariffs and duties. Uh, Lukashenko got his energy re-export trade. 300. 300, okay. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Lukashenko got his energy re-export trade back, right, which the Russians were determined to shut off during the initial negotiating phase. Fine, after Crimea, he got it immediately. And the Kazakhs opted out of anything that was even remotely political, right, including the parliament. And the Kyrgyz are now being dangled with, well, maybe you can keep your markets. So the, the kind of standardization of that economic space, I think, gave away, gave way to some of these more kinds of particularistic bargains. So I think, you know, yes, you're right, and I am using it with this sort of pejorative connotation, but on the other hand, just looking at the morphing form of the EU, it strikes me that there's a lot of, lot of side payments um, um, at a very early stage in its formation. So, you know, perhaps there'd be a better way to describe that. Maybe I should just, this is such an interesting topic, I should try and weigh in here. Um, I think, um, if, for those of you who haven't read the Ivan Krustev piece about arguing about the kind of new uh, Russian response to the uh, world order, um, it's a fantastic uh, piece about how Europe kind of uh, misunderstood Russia and, and, treat, and, and partly, this is again echoing that argument, treated uh, the Putin regime as though it was only interested in money and didn't have a kind of different conception of, of, of world order and this was one of the mistakes. Um, I would completely also endorse what Alex said about how I think one of the tragedies of the last couple of the Ukraine crisis was, was how Brussels abandoned its own model which was of a kind of soft economic um, uh, expansion um, through economic means uh, through as trade and, and economic attraction as, as its main arguments and, and started to try and play geopolitics and the European Union is not good at playing geopolitics. I mean, this was particularly true of obviously of, of um, Bilt and Sikorsky who were trying to lead the, to kind of repackage the Eastern Partnership and I think that's unfortunately what happened um, with Ukraine, um, this rather half-hearted attempt at, at, at geopolitics rather than, than using uh, economy and trade which, which Moscow had not found particularly threatening. So I think, I think that's, um, that's definitely true. In, in Fiona Hill's new expanded book on Putin with, with Cliff Gaddy, she quotes how uh, one Russian saying, um, Barroso or someone consulted us when they were, the EU was, was signing a free trade agreement with Croatia, but they didn't consult us when they were signing one with Ukraine, which is, you know, and, and that, that's a legitimate question there. Um, but I think that, that, that this then gets, if that is an argument to try and de-escalate 
on the European side by again using economic and, and trade as your as your main um, um, means of attraction to, um, rather than playing geopolitics, then that does raise all sorts of questions about though about the Russian side whether um, the the Russia has been purely captured by uh, an elite which is only interested in its own enrichment, not in, not in the Russian economy as a whole, or whether there is a one can still make an argument to Russia, uh, the Russians about some kind of cooperation, economic cooperation in Ukraine, and, and that's a question to which I don't have an answer. Yeah. Alexander Panov, uh, Voice of America, Russian Service. A uh, couple of questions to both of you. First of all, how could you explain or comment two recent Putin statements? First, that Ukrainian army is a legion of NATO. And second one, his appeal and his call to Ukrainian youth to come together as Lim in Russia to avoid to be recruiting to Ukrainian army. And the second question, uh, George Soros think that 50 billions of dollars would be enough to save Ukraine, save Ukraine econ economy, first of all. Is it sounds absolutely <coughs> unrealistic to Western leaders, to present Western leaders, to give such sum of money to Ukraine? Thank you. So, yeah, um, on the NATO statement, that was interesting, wasn't it? Uh, my colleague, Kim Martin, has a good post in Washington Post Monkey Cage blog, I believe yesterday, and her take is that this is a signal um, that the conflict now is no longer just uh, limited to, to Ukraine and that this is something that's fundamental to Russia's national interest. And it might, it might be paving the way to more open acknowledgement of Russian involvement, right? Um, that, um, you know, uh, uh, that if this is crafted as a sort of a NATO, uh, uh, you know, supported campaign, this is obviously something that directly infringes the security um, and and perceived uh, uh, sovereignty of, of of Russia. So, so I think you know um, maybe he just threw it out there. Maybe there's something, you know, deeper at, at stake. We'll see. Um, sorry, what was your second point? Uh, Oh, Soros, oh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and the billions of dollars. Look, Ukraine is in dire economic straits. I mean, I don't think we appreciate the magnitude of what's required. Uh, and I think, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, the loss of, um, you know, transit fees from the energy trade probably takes away one of, you know, the big kind of sources of rental income that wasn't sort of, you know, extractive and guaranteed. So the whole is, 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 is really big and you know we can talk about um, you know anti-corruption campaigns and we can talk about you know sort of democracy and the Western tilt and so forth but a lot of these ideals are going to be aspirational you know um, you know unless there's some sort of sort of functioning economic entity I mean I just don't see how the West is going to commit the types of funds a country like Ukraine needs in this kind of economic crisis and climate, um, you know, unfortunately for them. Hello, I'm Mikael from the University of Montreal. Uh, I had uh, two questions. Uh, if the, the Russians are seeing the expansion of the EU as one of their main uh, national security issues, I'm basing myself on their posture. Uh, when they have an interest in uh, continuing the conflict in the Ukraine, uh, for the reason of maybe creating a buffer state, so purely on like real realistic thoughts from their uh, national defense posture. Mm -hmm. My second question is, uh, uh, because I don't know much about Russia, so I was wondering, what's the impact of the public opinion there? Considering that Russia is a bit more of a quasi-democracy, not quite, you know, talk, take, talking about the, the liberty of the media and the such, are they are the public opinion there too excited, maybe, for the government to de-escalate the conflict if they're engaged in it? Thank you. Uh, all good questions. Um, yes, I mean, you know, this notion of buffer state is 
commonly accepted in a lot of geopolitical circles and thinking, and certainly in Russian circles, but you know, not just. <laughs> in U.S. circles, too, there are commentators who talk about you know, that, the, that the concept needs to be resurrected. It is an organizational type of form in, in global geopolitics that was made to manage contested and, and conflicted zones. Of course, it clashes with our very strong espousal of the principle of sovereignty, especially in this part of the world. Right? And, and this is, I think, one of the tensions. This is one of the sort of scripts that even to label something as a buffer country, I mean, would be just politically unacceptable here, right? And you can't, can't do that, right? It's all about having sovereign choices to join whoever you want. There's actually very few regions in the world where that principle operates, right? And, 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 and I think, you know, um, and we need to be a little honest about that. In terms of Russian public opinion, I mean, it was very supportive of Crimea still is, but I think the wrinkle here is Russian public opinion, and, and Kim also mentioned this yesterday in her piece, Russian public opinion about committing troops to Ukraine, right? How does that look? That's not as strong. Um, and so, you know, there's been some questions of, you know, hiding the body bags and, you know, mobile crematoria and, 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 and these things to sort of hide the actual mounting cost and toll, whether this would constitute a real uh, cause for sort of a decline in popularity of Putin, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think these are very different worlds. The media spaces, the coverage, the emotional appeals on both sides, you know, the sense of justice and grievance and so forth. Um, and, you know, I'd like to get Tom or you know, Gerard's reaction to this. I mean, you know, to me, there's, uh, there's very little indication to think that there'll be some sort of uh, in the near term, anyway, softening sort of public support here. Actually, I may add a little bit. Yeah. Um, monitoring kind of social media, and I think people underestimate that actually this conflict uh, it doesn't cost Russia that much uh, to keep it, to keep it hot. A, you have kind of this. I don't know. Like, I want to use kind of an ISIS analogy to where it's basically uh, you have existential uh, anybody with an existential issue. Uh, you know, you're not happy with life. Uh, you're not happy with your wife, you're not happy with whatever. What do you do? Well, you find this existential uh, a solution by going to the Donbass, believing uh, the Russian you know, uh, version that this is some kind of a, you know, this historic holy fight for you know, the Russian land. So the, these, the, a lot of these people, they're not mercenaries. They're actually people who are, uh, really truly believe what they're fighting for. And it's hard to kind of, you know, and they equip themselves a lot of times. There's actually quite a few organizations. Uh, there was actually a recent article about there's a training center in St. Petersburg. It's called the Shooting Range or something like they call it, but completely apparently self-sustaining. Uh, and again, so you know, perhaps Russia supplies uh, heavy equipment, uh, you know, heavy um, sophisticated equipment. But again, it doesn't cost Russia that much. So I don't think economics are not going to be the tilting. And again, in, in the end, even if it was that expensive, I think Russia does see this as kind of. Uh, Hi, Rachel Salzman. I'm a doctoral student at SAIS. Um, I'm writing on Russia and BRICS, and I just got back from eight months of research in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And the main kind of, the official line there is that they don't care that the other BRICS countries haven't recognized yeah. Crimea, but that they're good with neutrality. Yeah. And I was wondering about what you were saying about rewriting international rules, that obviously they would rather that China said, yes, Crimea is yours. But at the end of the day, if you combine this with what they're doing with BRICS in terms of the bank and the CRA, which yeah. could be interesting and could be nothing, but right. they're happening even in the wake of everything else, that this has been a very Western-centered discussion, yep. which makes sense. But whether the silence is something they can play with to do kind of a death by a thousand cuts yeah. to what's going on. So I'd love your comment on whether mm -hmm. they are in fact actually succeeding at what they're trying to do, but just in a way that is a lot bloodier and messier than they would wish or yeah. we would wish. Uh, that's a great question, and, and I look forward to reading your, your dissertation when it comes out. I'm actually you know, teaching a course on sort of post-Western IR and so forth, so BRICS figures prominently and always looking for good material there. Um, you know, I, I, I think this gets to a broader discussion about world order. You know, for Russia, it's been in a kind of counter-hegemonic, revisionist mode for some time now. I think the financial crisis to them was sort of the signal that, aha, the moment has come. Right. This is this is now, right? And now we're going to band together, and 
the bricks and the SEO and, and then so forth is going to be the platform. Of course, part of the problem is the financial crisis also really strapped Russia and the, the balance in economic power between Russia and China just went way over to Beijing, which has also been you know, amplified um, by the Ukraine crisis, you know, this toll to China. Uh, China has been perhaps more supportive of the annexation than people would have thought before. Um, but China also is fundamentally uh, stuck with a long border Russia and strategic partnership with Russia. And uh, the Chinese understand Russian concerns. They're very sensitive to them um, and, and certainly understand uh, um, the sort of, uh, you know, the meme of Maidan and, and foreign influence. But at the same time, you know, my understanding um, sort of being in Beijing um, last year was you know, that, that, that the Russians only got very, very tepid statements out of Beijing on specifics and the, the, the Chinese. No, no, right. So then I'm getting to your, to your yeah. sort of answering. So, 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 my, so my sense is no um, for the moment, right? And so what, 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 you know, the question is, is order, is it challenged from above or does it become challenged from below, right? And so once the BRICS bank starts functioning, if it lends, right, if it succeeds, if it functions, same with the Asian infrastructure ban, if you actually create this hub for alternative um, um, development lending and so forth with different criteria and so forth, then you might get into a phase where you start getting a kind of uh, a public good substitution effect, right, that you're not only turning to the West and IFIs for sort of global public goods, that there are these other areas to do it. We're still a long way from that. Right? The second thing I would say on BRICS is like we still haven't solved, for me, um, what our dilemmas of any international organization, which is distributional kinds of consequences, right? Who gets the capital, who gets control, um, and so forth. They're going to have to deal with all of that beyond the ceremony. And if I take the SEO as a test case, right, um, these are real issues, right? So China would love the SEO to be a kind of a economic forum through which you conduct trade and um, development lending and so forth, and every step Russia said no, right? So no anti-crisis fund, no regional development bank because it wants its own architectures. And of course, you know, they don't talk about this publicly, right? It's just sort of in, in private, but, but those fundamental tensions in international relations about who gets what from the arrangement, they're going to apply to Western and non-Western groups. So I think it's the first salvo, um, and we'll see sort of downstream. Uh, but but I don't think um, you see the appetite for this kind of Russian revisionist project. Uh, not from Brazil and India, anyway. Not yet. You know, China might be multiple layers. Uh, Lee Avershov, actually. I am uh, part of the Center for uh, on Global Interests. Uh, I wanted to follow my colleague's question. Dr. Kuli, you uh, mentioned uh, that Ukraine was an existential, is an existential issue for Russia. So two part, uh, you view that as a, an excuse or a true uh, situation? Yeah. Is it for uh, the reasons, uh, as you said, possibly being viewed as a buffer zone uh, or as a dangerous example, uh, challenge to Putin in his view? And two, uh, do you think that the issue of uh, economic uh, association with the EU was just an excuse? Um, you know, I think it's it's difficult to, you know, focus on any one of these as sort of constructs. I mean, I think it's clear that it's viewed, um, uh, and, and this gets to the different scripts, right? right? That this is a question of co-ethnics, supposedly. This is a question of self-determination, it's a question of fundamental Russian um, um, national security. Um, it's a question, I take Putin's Crimea speech literally in, uh, for, for most of it. I think it's a fascinating speech um, and as a teacher that the ban has snapped, right? That you pushed us, right? And all these things, NATO expansion, color revolutions, NGOs, all these things, and you thought we were just going to stop and take it, we're not taking it anymore. I, I take him at his word there, right? So that's what I mean. I, I don't think you can just say something's an excuse, right, or something's about something else. 
I think it's about the whole thing. <laughs> I think it's about Western incursion. I think it's about the importance of Ukraine. I think it's about Russian national interest. I think all of these things are now bundled up. That's what makes this so tricky, so difficult, and multidimensional um, in its very essence, I think. Um, and, you know, and I'll just go back 10 years, also 2004. Um, if there was sort of any question as to what Ukraine meant, right, to Russia, um, you know, a lot of the backlash that I've talked about in other contexts, the sort of democracy promotion and, and the kind of anti-NGO activities, the kind of zombie election monitors and so forth, can be traced back to the impact of 2004, right? So this didn't come back just from, uh, from nowhere. We have a decade of the manufacturing of a lot of these kinds of counter institutions and counter norms in this emerging kind of, um, kind of space. Speaking of election monitors. Yeah, although that's not going to be my question. Yeah. Doug Wake, former uh, US diplomat and OSCE official. Um, uh, first, just, just a footnote on the point you just made. Um, if you go back just a little bit before 2004, I think uh, Western, as perceived from Moscow, Western scuttling of a deal uh, which would have justified the long-term presence of Russian forces in Moldova was also something that uh, Putin reacted to quite strongly as a uh, signal that um, these guys are pushing us too far and getting in our space. Um, what I wanted to do with my question was to ask you to almost write the next chapter of this little report. Um, because what I see in the report are several scenarios, um, at least three of which all involve a sort of divided Ukraine with uh, some kind of equilibrium at a certain point where the Russians are not going to push farther into Ukraine and Ukraine right. is not going to have de facto control over right. Donbass. Um, and then you talk about Western dilemmas and policies. But the question that people were asking when I was uh, just recently uh, on a, a short-term uh, visiting fellowship in Riga is, but then what's Russia's next step? Right. And there, there seemed to be, there seemed to be a sort of optimistic and a pessimistic scenario from uh, one being that um, you would have some kind of retrenchment and declaration of victory that, you know, Russia has, as in 2008, Georgia, you know, shown the West that it can um, uh, push back and, and establish uh, some kind of uh, control where, um, the West thought it was going to be in charge, or you could see some sort of new adventurism, mm -hmm. um, it be in southeastern Latvia, in sure. uh, northeastern Estonia, or perhaps more likely um, somewhere that doesn't push the NATO Article 5 uh, button, but uh, you know, increase in troop presence in Transnistria or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have a speculation or a sense about which way this will go? And if, if the answer is you don't know, what factors are likely to push Russia in one direction or the other? Oh, wow. So that's, that's, that's really <laughs> tough. I mean, look, that, you know, you, you have the pulse in the Baltics more than I do. I mean, I don't think it's any secret that there has always been, um, you know, a, a, a a desire in the Kremlin to sort of, you know, really test the credibility of Article Five commitments by poking at them, right? And so, you know, Latvia is certainly uh, one possible arena for this. You know, the use of so-called hybrid warfare, regular warfare types of techniques. Where do you draw those lines, right? What constitutes the sort of threshold um, for the commitment? Um, I think these are serious issues, I, and I think Riga is right to be concerned. Now, whether it will be triggered or not, I don't know. But I do know that this constant lashing out that we see, right? I think there was just a sort of an incident in UK airspace um, earlier today. Um, you know, this escalation is a clear signaling that don't mess with us, we will mess with you, right? So how do we diffuse that? How do we go back? I mean, I, you know, again, without at some point some sort of negotiated settlement that um, uh, doesn't cave to Russian uh, uh, interests, but offers some sort of ladders out 
right? I think we're going to be in this mode for, for some way. And that's why I'm saying, what are the, the low cost things we could do, right? So for me, you know, some sort of, you know, EU, EEU forum, you know, I think it's something that should be explored in the context of a final negotiated settlement. The real problem that we have is that we don't have a lot of conceptual thinking on either part on how we can mix the governance and influences in these spaces. We don't. Um, in part because, you know, they're attached to mechanisms that I think are geopolitical in orientation. And I think that's really what this crisis is highlighting. And B, I'm not sure that the level of engagement on the issue in terms of trying to find creative solutions and way out is commensurate with how serious the problem is here. Right? And I think that's sort of another kind of observation that would throw there. So could it get worse? Could it fan out in other places? Possibly, yeah. I mean I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't deny it. If only because if the back, you know, if, if there's a back to the wall and if it's the whole question of regional order that's on the table, there will be many other strings to pull on and to poke, I think, for sure. Oleg Merkulov, <clears throat> Business and Baltic correspondent from Latvia, Riga. Nice. So, yeah. What do you think? I'll ask you. <laughs> so, yeah, as we know, the fair share of uh, population in Latvia are Russian-speaking. Right. This includes Belarusians, Poles, Jews, Russians, uh, Russian speaking, or Russians. And they are leaning toward Russia. According to all the surveys, they are, well, let's say, uh, Russians in Latvia are more pro Putin than Russians in Moscow, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is right now, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the American tanks have, a, uh, have arrived, and uh, some battalions have arrived to Latvia. So do you think the West uh, is uh, uh, escalating the situation more than it's supposed to be uh, preliminary because nothing has happened? Yeah. Yet, no, I, I, no, I, I don't think so in this particular case, right? So once you're a member of NATO, you have certain expectations and other countries have obligations to you, right? I mean, I think you know Article Five commitments for them to be credible have to be taken seriously. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think there is a massive distinction between NATO members and non-NATO members, and for the most part, that's where a lot of people draw the lines of say, you know, providing, you know lethal military support, for instance, and, and, and so forth. You know, what are actual commitments and should we extend sort of beyond those commitments? Um, a lot will make the argument that it's the fact that they are in NATO that has prevented, right, the escalation. Maybe that's true. Um, but I do think you're going to see more and more poking and pioneering in these kinds of different modes of engagement, whether sort of fanning the flames through supports of NGOs, social media, media commentaries, all these sorts of things that can be done, um, you know, certainly sort of part of the agenda. But is it an overreaction to send troops? I don't think so. I think you need to sort of uh, signal credibility. But it does have these network effects, right? And I think that also needs to be acknowledged, that, you know, you, you back an ally in a particular context, and that signals in another context, oh my gosh, this is escalation going on, um, and so forth. But that's that's part of the policy dilemma that the West finds itself, where it has sort of categories of countries with these security commitments to, and others that it's sympathetic to, that it doesn't have security commitments to, and managing these different relationships is, is tricky um, in, in our day and age. I think we'll uh, actually end there. Thank you for joining CGI. Uh, today, we also, if you guys would check out our website, uh, we're going to have uh, many interesting events coming up. Uh, we talked about China. We're going to have uh, US, Russia, China. Um, events uh, as well as uh, events that are uh, kind of uh, assessing halfway through Putin's third term. Um, so again, and please join me in thanking very much uh, Tom DeWall and Alexander Cooley for a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you.